um today in the session it's going to be a very um experiential uh, rather than a rather than an academic session it's it's going to be heavily rooted in my own journey uh, as you had asked me to speak about um so um in the session what i hope to uh, cover is my basic standpoint as a person with an anti caste anti islamophobic and uh, gender just positionality um before getting into the details of established first and foremost what islamophobia is for people who might not be um zainab uh, apologies yeah. there is some disruption like there is disturbance with maybe the mic i think it's the uh, notes that i have in front of me is it gone now yes okay thank you okay um islamophobia's um widely accepted definition is what's shown on the screen islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of muslimness and perceived uh, or perceived muslimness this is the uh, definition that's widely accepted and was coined by um all party parliamentary group uh, group in uh, uh, group for british muslims um so uh, and again before getting into the details uh, there are uh, just establishing the two kinds of discrimination here islamophobia and then eventually uh, caste atrocities blatant and benevolent forms of discrimination um is um blatant forms of dif uh, discrimination means the ones that culminate in the physical violence the ones that end up in tv and media that we see and the benevolent forms of discrimination is i i believe and uh, uh, i believe which is more vicious and more dangerous because it it operates on a very personal level in our social circles in our uh, familial circles and i am adopting the benevolent uh, islamophobia term from malcolm x who, who used the term benevolent racism so we can use benevolent islamophobia and benev uh, blatant islamophobia and uh, blatant casteism and be uh, benevolent casteism um all right so um uh, even though benevolent uh, even though blatant form of islamophobia is only on the rise um in in the last decade in 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 the country apparently um i have always grown up being somebody with an anti uh, anti islamophobic uh, stand and uh, th this is much before the term uh, islamophobia started seeping into uh, media conversations or academia that is primarily because um my identity has always been that of uh primarily been that of a faith based uh, person um and of a muslim so uh being someone who is personally and socially engaged in um constantly uh, who is constantly engaged in the act of being muslim this muslimness comes and comes first and foremost to me and that that also includes uh, relating to and feeling for uh my community people in various geographical locations all over the world for example if you are taking of of decades long of struggle of uh, palestinians in philistine and then uh we have uh, as a current example we have uighur muslims in china's uh, detention centers and much more examples that we can see all over the world so um so this perspective in its very non academic experiential uh, sense uh, made me understand how there is a collective uh, muslim plight collective islamophobic muslim plight all over the world and this is something that has to be sensitized uh, sensitized and um, especially because this this community is not being spoken about in the ways it needs to be or when even when we are at the brink of a genocide uh according to uh, the genocide watch the 10 stages of genocides that we can see we are on the eighth stage and we still have our majority of people in the country being silent or pol policing which forms of uh protest is okay by the muslim community uh, so uh so this is something we need to be islamophobia is something we need to understand is is uh, rising exponentially and also be aware of and also 
uh, work towards dismantling it at every uh, level, including personnel. So um, in the same process of being Muslim, uh, it is also necessarily important to voice out and fight for uh, oppressive communities. So uh, again, say, uh, uh, again, uh, referring to being a faith-based identity first and foremost before any identity for me, uh, this fighting for oppression is uh, central to being Muslim. So uh, the first time that I am majorly acquainted to the Andika's movement is through uh, Rohit Vemila movement that was in 2016 and I was in my final year of schooling. And that was the time I'm first, uh, and first in the sense majorly uh, acquainted into this um, huge discrimination that is happening. And uh, when I say first, I mean, that is a time that I recognized caste system is also not just existing on a blatant caste atrocity level, but also on a benevolent uh, caste system, uh, casteist uh, existence, and that it can take lives for those people who did not, who, who could not, uh, despite uh, any, uh, despite their own willpower, uh, make through the system. Um, so that's first and foremost. So uh, in, in the session, uh, what I'm planning to uh, cover is basically this need for having an anti-Islamophobic, anti-caste, uh, gender just, uh, justice perspective while we are talking about uh, Indian context. Um, then the, the PPT is basically just uh, words here and there so that if, because this is a long lecture slash session, a talk, uh, if anybody um, drifts, uh, drifts off in between, it, there is something to come back to. Um, so I did my uh, college in uh, DU, Delhi University, uh, and uh, I am from Kerala, right? Um, so it was in college that, that I first realized that everything that we have seen through the lens of class and elitism had to be essentially um, seen through the lens of um, casteism and its hierarchies at a very structural level. Um, from day one of high class, uh, elite class people um, gearing towards each other in the process of friendship forming, you know, uh, finding those circles, very uh, endogamous kind of circles, uh, to debating the need and uh, non-necessity of reservations in classroom. Uh, this has always been this, this like the, the feeling of authorization and alienation started from day one. Um, in, in various, the, the day one would mean ori or orientation program for the whole college and, and references from there. Um, and being from this college that, uh, famously advocates, famously says it gives a magical experience to its student. Three years later, um, ask any mar marginalized community people and they would say they were not only denied this experience of magic, but also were struggling to survive in, uh, in campuses with their identities. So um, when, if one thing that everybody relates to is this, uh, debates on reservations. Um, and when debates on reservations, it's uh, the thing is um, such debates are essentially debating whether the half of the class, which is 27% uh, OBC, 17% uh, uh, fifteen percent scheduled ca caste and uh, seven point five percent of ST community, which comprises of uh, half of the class, whether these this half of the class deserves to be there. So all the um, you know uh, in these campuses, in these very privileged, esteemed institutions where talks on mental health and the need for um, awareness and all that is there. This is this is happening at par, you know. On on one side, the need for being woke by everybody who came to the universities with very uh, years of cultural capital, cultural and social capital accumulated, and the rest of the half of the class who had to fight so many social obstacles and barriers to reach such places, 
their their need for being in the class is being de debated and uh, at all these times the thing is marginalized people's mental health is also um very marginalized you know uh, because um there is no language that is in in the in the um, in the indian scenario at least that specifically uh, deals with this uh, culturally sensitive therapeutic interventions or um there is no access to re recovery and um also how do you recover or how do you heal in an ongoing triggering atmosphere right so um this is from this is uh, like if i'm taking ex examples there are a lot of examples to say so i am i'm just going to touch on the very basic necessities and we can open the floor for discussion uh but when on a very when i say very structural level what do you do when uh, faculties and academicians also take part in this process of uh, alienating you and uh, otherizing you you constantly feel like they are the um there has been instances where professors refer to uh, the uh, cleaning laborers in the college as samars in front of the whole class um like uh, there has been institution uh, th there has been instances where because of the need to have inclusive syllabus we have um some inclusive uh, inclusive content here and there we had an entire paper on understanding ambedkar and uh, we had um, papers by leila Abu abulagud and all these people so um, to take an example when this uh, understanding ambedkar paper was being taught in the classroom the the entire paper is filled with brilliant stuff it's all original writings by ambedkar and uh, writings by uh, gopal guru uh, gail omvet and all these brilliant people so in classroom because you have to teach what is in the syllabus teachers would teach it and we also have uh, our our pedagogical process is divided into um, having classroom lectures and tutorial rooms so in tutorial rooms in its very um, informal setting um, the same teacher who had to teach um, ambedkar's original lectures would come to the tutorial groups and say uh, you know what um, ambedkar only spoke about the bad aspects of hinduism you know like we need to speak about the good aspects also you it's it's not fair that you look at one thing in only one sense and this is this is including this is the the addresses of this remarks would be including people from marginalized communities and so forth and then um when in like when um protests happen for people who are uh, marginalized within the faculties you know um, for example it's in, in it's in the same du that uh, um professor hani babu is being incarcerated and um at the same at the same space where you where professors would emphasize on the need to uh, be you know have descend and uh, st stand your foot uh, hani babu when it comes to Pro professor hani babu they wouldn't say anything and this hani babu thing happened after i passed uh, passed uh, from lsa but uh, you you are still acquainted with what's happening and there would be no uh, conversation around it so many other things that would happen at the same time uh, but there would be no discussions about it um and the thing is the mental health aspect that i'm talking about the reason why it also goes down uh, the drain very much is especially because um you begin noticing that when your world is suddenly you know upside down because of everything that is happening around it was that time 2016 to personally it was 2016 to 2019 the peak of you know what eventually led to the the government being reelected and all the things that happened in between um um so at at that time you notice that your world is not okay but the rest of the world is not only okay but also carries around carries on with their lives and all that without even acknowledging something very very dangerous is happening and that their own peers are going through 
through very dire emotional uh, situations. So, um, and that is also that feeling of left being left out also increases, especially when uh, places like uh, Lady Shriram College that um, that famously talks about um, feminism and uh, all that you understand the 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 strand of feminism that they uh, they you know align with is only brahmin feminism or white feminism because uh, an instance like um, a, a, an instance like boys locker room that that shattered the, so many uh, people's like silences you know something boys locker room was this instance where um, the uh, screenshots of several boys uh, were caught where they were uh, objectifying uh, uh, women and all that that shattered the silence of a lot of people but that is again that is the extent to which the shattering of silence can take place at the same time when people like hadia uh, who were uh, hadia was this person for those who don't know who who had to go through extrajudicial house arrest because she chose to convert to islam and it was it was a long uh, time when the extrajudicial house arrest was also happening at the time the case was in the court and hadia in the court in supreme court was saying this this very famous uh, uh, dialogue that resonated with so much of us i want freedom in the largest democracy of this world a, a muslim woman a convert is coming up and saying i want freedom i want to live with my partner but the um, the uh, chance of feminism that is there that is still happening it, it doesn't it, it's not silence at that particular time it's happening but people like hadia or people like um, asifa who was um, um, killed in um, katua in jammu and so many other people do not make it to the discourse and people like fatima latif who had to go through uh, her own experiences of uh, discrimination at IIT Madras, who who also famously said, told her mom that her identity is her biggest problem before getting institutionally murdered by uh, IIT Madras. So um, all these instances are happening at the same time when uh, it's only happening inside of you and not, you know, around you and all that. Um, another instance that I would, I, I would say uh, that personally hurt me a lot was um, during a research paper turnover. Um, we were supposed to do book reviews, and I had chosen uh, Seba Mahmood's Politics of Piety, few chapters from it to do the book review on, and that was a particular uh, paper research paper uh, situation where all the students were being very leniently marked. Um, there was no uh, stringent forms of, you know, cutting down because it was book review. Everybody had worked really hard and the professor was leniently marking, just not me. And um, I refused to believe that it was because of the lack of quality of the paper, not only because I don't believe it that way, but also because the professor had went ahead to write in the paper on the when next to the marking that she had uh, she went on to write but zainab uh, so uh, before getting into it um, for those who are not familiar with sabah Mahmood, uh, mahmoud's work sabah mahmoud talked about muslim women and the agency that they have and how uh, muslim women you know uh, she was she was bent on um, deriving alternative frameworks to the ones that are already reg there regarding Muslim women beyond the uh, beyond the concepts of choice and uh, very one-sided notions of choice. So it was it it resonated with me as a Muslim woman with agency that goes without saying. But uh, what she had written along the marking was that, but Zainab, you have not spoken about Muslim women in terrorist organizations. That was all that was. So. Um, be writing a paper on uh, Muslim women's uh, consciousness and their agency being there, despite having a, a inherently faith-based identity, 
I should also speak about everything else that is happening. I should be this politics of condemnation that Muslims are constantly, um, you know, uh, Muslims constantly have to be there. Like if, if I'm here and something happens across the world where one Muslim person was caught, I would have to condemn it. So, um, and the sad part to that experience uh, was even further for me, because after a semester, I confided in one of my um, upper caste friends about this situation that has happened. Uh, and what she told me was, Zainab, let's go, let's go and confront and let's go and tell her that this is not okay. This is the reason why I mentioned that the friend was upper caste. Because sadly and ironically that this thought of going and telling this professor that this was not okay did not occur to me in the least. And I think when I was reflecting further on it, I understood that is because being first generation or second generation learners from your family and being in these institutions that has been denying access to community, marginalized community people for so long, I either uh, by technicalities or by um, in, uh, you know, creating uh, social obstacles all along the way in school through uh, the process and all of it, I was just lucky to be there. That was the feeling, all of it, you know? Like I am here, um, I am here in a space that was denied all along and um, it, it was difficult to find an, another Muslim uh, or visibly Muslim person in the campus wearing a hijab. So for me, it the, the inferiority complex to all that, it was that I was just lucky to be here. How would I just go and uh, confront a teacher that what she said and just materially also wrote on the paper was just wrong. So um, um, this, this situation had, you know, this along with so many other events uh, changed me, like changed my perspective of how uh, all of us survive within campuses very much. Um, now, these are like being in Delhi uh, from 2016 to 2020, um, the, the college instances were not the only thing that was happening. This is happening at par, right? You are in colleges where it is supposed to be a safe space and it is a safe space when physically speaking, but then you're also in public and the being in public and the very visibility of your vulnerability since, um, since the sensitization of being a, a hijab wearing person or the sensitization regarding your vulnerability um, when uh, men wear skull cap and all that has been happening for a while, then this this uh, this F starts affecting you uh, very much. Uh, here is like it, it it is at this juncture I would say like there needs to be an identity anxiety or a, a category called identity anxiety. So anxiety for those who are not familiar with the language. Uh, uh, anxiousness is a feeling of nervousness, according to uh, Professor Judson, Judson of uh, Judson Brewer of Brown University. Uh, he's a neuroscientist there. So, according to him, yeah, anxiety is a feeling of nervousness, worry, or unease about an imminent event or something with an uncertain in uh, outcome. Uh, so, uh, anxiety is fear plus. Uh, uncertainty, not knowing what will happen. And within the category of anxiety, we have social anxiety, where um, social anxiety is a type of anxiety that causes um, extreme fear in social settings. So within social anxiety, with being in public and the never ending anxiety surrounding what will happen to you because of all the surrounding violences surrounding your identity, uh, social anx anxiety in these increasingly intolerant times has to also include identity anxiety as an important subcategory because what was once an apparent anomaly is no more an, uh, no more an, an anomaly. It's, it's a rule rather than the exception. Um, I, I would not say it was an apparent anomaly. It was an anomaly. That's why I use the word apparent because uh, that has been what the mainstream uh, mainstream argues that there has been no threat, there has been nothing going on, but years of all the uh, culmination of benevolent forms of uh, Islamophobia that has been happening. 
um, um, in in being in public, uh, especially after um, Junaid's lynching, the 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 little boy who was lynched in a train because of his visible uh, identity wearing a skull cap, I remember changing my experience completely. Um, being uh, my my hostel was only two minutes away from the campus and there was only a two minutes walking distance uh, from my hostel to the college and because of so many instances of um, sexual harassment in in the neighborhood um, there was a police patrol van that was stationed 24 into 7 around the campus and that stationing was between my hostel to the um, uh, you know, uh, college. And when I am passing these this van, there would be on the window pane, there would be images of wandered people, essentially people in skull caps or essentially people in hijabs. And when I am pa passing through, uh, through that area, uh, near the vans, the vans that are there to necessarily provide me with protection from gender, based violences gives me chills at that time. At that time, all that I can think about is all the fake encounters that happen, all the instances of uh, being publicly, when, when uh, lynchings happen, police being just there folding their hands and uh, other instances where uh, pogroms happen and again, police aiding in the process or uh, again, just being mere spectators. So when I am alone and passing through that area, it, it that three years of experience was, that also stays very uh, much in my core memory. Um, uh, then also in being in public again, the, the social anxiety, the, the identity anxiety that is cultivated by these people very strategically, um, you know, in, in all these, I have been in, in my, like first years in being in Delhi, I have been multiple times asked in the metro stations um, regarding my uh, nationality, whether it is Afghanistani or uh, Pakistani identities that I have. And all these, the thing is all these questions, what they do is it essentially makes you feel like the other, which is already happening, but also more than that, you don't feel like you belong you really don't feel like you belong. So when an instance where you're not asked these questions, when there are like when there are people who could have asked you these questions, you feel thankful. You just feel thankful to be in these situations, um, getting the bare minimum where people are not problematizing your identity. Um, and the instances of, again, um, being denied housings for Muslim people and Dalits, is very much again part of this cultivating uh, cultivation of identity anxiety. Uh, my own experiences of being denied uh, uh, lodgings after college, uh, near college, asking like where I am from, what am I doing, and all that. Uh, and then what eventually happens is you go and take a room in the uh, ghettoized Muslim population, wherever Muslim populations are, at, uh, like in, in Delhi, for example, being Butler House or Jamia Nagan and all this. And these people do that. The per perpetrators do this uh, whole um, otherization and then throwing you into this corner uh, which was maybe not your first uh, choice uh, due to so many things uh, in, in terms of commute and all that things. But what happens is these localities then turn to be called mini Pakistans or uh, where uh, if, you, if you book an Uber and uh, Uber people cannot see your destination, but they call you and they ask you where you're going. And if you say you're going to Okla, or Jamia Nagar or Butler House, they cancel the call saying that I, I'm, I, I'm gonna be right there. But then the moment the call is uh, done, they cancel the call. And if you say that, if you don't say where you're going to, they again understand from your um, name uh, displayed on the screen. And again, that leads to cancellation. So it's all it's it's it, it, all to do with this visibility, this, this visibility and, you know, visibility, not just being of hijab or skull cap, but also, uh, your name, basic name, 
my name is a very uh, very arabic and long name it's zainab amal abdul hamid when it comes to uh, all the uh, paper works that we see and that they look at the paper and they look at me whether it's it's an indian person or like what is this person doing here kind of situation um yeah then despite so all these things are happening in the college and uh, parallelly outside college and this is happening what essentially saved me was finding saved me and many other people from uh, having even was a uh, mental health situation was finding uh, and forming bahujan camaraderie um, i remember it was in my second semester that suddenly in the campus when until then it was a very individual experience and suddenly in the campus there was posters for um rohit vemla uh, commemoration of 2000 uh, um, 2018 yes to, um no 2017 so um that was the first time i knew that i was not alone and then and that there are people who are going through the same things and it it was then like you turn up for the meet uh, program and then the slogans of jbm is happening and it's it's that was the first very overwhelming and heartwarming heartwarming moment for me and then from there all of us just connect so the thing is friendship forming process which is a very um which takes time d- did not take time there because these are people whom you didn't know beforehand but these are people who shared the same traumas of being to belonging to different marginalized communities be it uh, dalit muslim adivasi vimukta uh, nepali communities in the country and all this so from there we just all of us just click and form that very close camaraderie it was not an organization or anything at that time uh, but rather a group that was very very strong in its term of uh, holding each other close you know and uh, then Uh, we started conducting programs and all of that um, at the LSR baggage shed. So why I uh, say the symbolism of LSR baggage shed is also because um, LSR baggage shed is a shed outside of LSR, technically outside of LSR. So you can't in a in a campus that is famously again um, publicizing its apolitical stand. A politics, as we know, is not a political stand. It is a politics of convenience of and of. Uh, Uh, and of siding with the oppressor um, but in in such a campus we are, we we started conducting programs uh, small programs small gatherings in in the shed that was outside the back gate and then eventually over the years this back gate shed is becoming a, a very beautiful uh, rendezvous for bahujan um, resistance and protest and all that um and that becomes that became a very symbolic thing also because the, one of the first programs that we conducted was on caste and cleanliness uh calling beswada wilson the convener national convener of safai karmachari andolan and that day uh, suddenly the back gate which is never closed uh, other than the timings it has to be closed suddenly that day the back gate closed and when when we asked they were like there is some renovation happening and the students were stopped much before reaching the back gate so you wouldn't really know if a renovation was happening so you would have to get out of the front gate to get to the back gate shed which is a very long way and people who are not very determined politically to get to the uh, uh, rendezvous for the meeting for the program people would drop out and it would become a less pro- popular program and then over like time different programs that we conducted like uh, the, the 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 funny thing is the turnout would be generally the same group of people it's it's it, in a very big campus it will always still be the same group of people who are either from the marginalized communities or who wants to be who want to be strong allies but the um administrative you know uh, how how they tried curbing the attendance was always the same but always the same people was were the ones who showed up um, especially when beswada wilson's uh, um, program posters were being stuck throughout the campus the next day we came to f- f- find out that uh, posters were torn and we also saw that it was 
um, people in higher ranks of administration in the administrative office that was also involved in tearing down the posters. So, um, um, so despite having such strong bones, you know, of uh, Bahujan people coming to each other, uh, Bahujan in the very sense Kanshiram, uh, uh, Maniavar Kanshiram ji used uh, of all the minority communities, all the uh, marginalized communities, SEST, OBC, uh, Muslim, uh, Vimukta communities, all those communities coming together to form the numerical majority in that Bahujan in that sense. Uh, despite having such strong connections, um, it would still not be enough. Um, the, the thing is, throughout all the programs in the campus, throughout all the graduation, from the graduation day to um, other big events, we find the time to be together and sometimes celebrating each other's birthday. All of us just together, this is to remember, this is still, these were still people who started their friendships through collective trauma and not by having uh, their historical, you know, uh, knowing their uh, personal history or anything. So uh, despite having that support circle, it is still not enough. Um, still not enough in the sense, um, one thing we need to understand is also that uh, places like LSR, Miranda House, um, and uh, St. Stephen's and all these places, uh, these places are ranked high in academics and ranking high in the academics would also mean the core structure is very rigorous and it's very demanding and hectic. So when students are going through this uh, very dire situations, uh, very difficult personal situations while also being a collective experience, they are also with left with lack of support in academic circles also in 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 academic uh, in terms of academic support also that would eventually lead to less uh, the marks being very less these might be students who scored really good, good in schools and then end up with not great, not so great marks uh, basically with all others with all other struggles of adjusting to a hectic uh, schedule by also going through anxiety and other depression because of all these things uh, in a very uh, on a very strong level um, so i would say like in in these situations when I, when i mention how upper caste communities uh, people from uh, upper class backgrounds gear towards each other in again forming their friendships uh, sharing very similar surnames and all that uh, one common response would be what did we do but it is also important to understand in, in a very upper caste normalcy, in a very Islamophobic normalcy, it is uh, quoting, taking from uh, Angela Davis, where in a, in a racist society, it's not only really important to be non-racist, non but also anti-racist. So in a very upper caste normalcy created induced situation, it's important to not only really open your circles not, it's not just about consciously opening your circles, but, but it's also about consciously being aware of your choices, of, uh, of not making people around you feel that, uh, feel, go through the situations um, in, in their, uh, so the thing is the people from marginalized communities, when they look at their three years of uh, experience in colleges, uh, the main, if, if more than the, enjoyments that, that they had during their college life, which is basically what the mainstream uh, experience is supposed to look like. If they're recalling, if, if they recall their, um, their mental health struggles the most than, have, than being able to enjoy their college lives, it's important that we understand what is happening there. And it's important that we uh, go forward to dissect what is happening there. Um, going on, um, I was also asked to speak about my, um, uh, one second. Okay. Yeah. Something with my voice, my partner said. Okay. So, um, 
my jhapi massacre so um how did i come to research on marijapi massacre so, um, a massacre that there basically very less um, number of you know uh, very less number of researches has been carried out in the english language there there are um, um, oral histories in bengali language but other than that there's very less and so i um, randomly stumbled on it and then understood that there is very less research on the um you know massacre and then when i when i decided to read more i also understood that this all the online medias that they uh, all the online online medias that talked about marijapi massacre was using the same excerpts from the same book uh, called the blood island by deep haldar and um, that is a book that covers all the sites even of the uh, per perpetrators included in the massacre and it was the same excerpts from it and it was basically because uh, media or uh, fact finding reports were not there of the marijapi massacre and that you can also find very similar patterns of preventing documentations in other uh, marginalized communities also uh, to prevent remembrances remembrance is a very strong political act and that is why it is important to uh, to go to our histories to understand what is happening and then um, then reearth what was happening in our own languages uh, to bring back um, the um, uh, impunity atrocities and all that and make these people make the perpetrators accountable so uh, briefly speaking about the marijapi massacre uh, marijapi massacre happened in 1979 and um, this was essentially the bengali namashudra uh, dalit communities that that went through this um, namashudra identity was and i was one of the largest and strongest um, dalit organization in the pan indian uh, history um which was in the uh, on the today's other side of bangladesh uh, to uh, today's uh, bangladesh so at that time before partition this was one of the strongest alliances there and they had strong alliances with the muslim communities there and together uh, dalits and muslim communities together had kept the bengali uh, tri caste bengali badrulog uh, congress party and all at bay so it was a very strategic measure to um to stop such a such an organization from happening and how they the, they understood how um, you know the, this strength can undermine every upper caste uh, hierarchical uh, institutions and it it's it said that the bengali partition was very strategically um, done uh, in order to especially undermine and scatter this movement and impoverish the movement and weaken the moment essentially so once they were uh, in india uh, as refugees uh, they were, were like the when the upper caste bengali people from uh, today's bangladesh were reinstated within bangla uh, west bengal itself which is again it's it's important to be if there is a space to uh, reinstate you would always prefer to a space that is um very similar to you in, in with regard to where you are from right so upper caste people when they were reinstated in Bang, uh, west bengal the dalit refugees were reinstated all the way into central india and even in places like andaman uh, and nicobar islands and then after years and after almost two decades of being there in horrible uh, situations in the camps where multiple instances of different kinds of atrocities including a uh, trigger warning rape was also happening they finally decide to uh, embark on a journey uh, to uh, marijapi marijapi is a is an island in the sundarbans which was 75 kilometers east to west uh, 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 east to kolkata and um, basically they narrowed down on marijapi because it was also part of sundarbans which sundarbans uh, a huge part of sundarbans is also in west in in today's bangladesh so very similar situations in terms of the land the fertility of the soil 
and so many situations like that. And also, it was also because it was an uninhibited uh, island. So um, after years of being promised by the uh, CPM government who came to power uh, during that time, uh, being promised constantly that if they come to power, the first thing that they would do is bring the refugees from um, these refugee camps to West Bengal, they went back on their promise and it, done with the waiting, they, they were uh, hell bent on uh, creating a beautiful township in uh, Marichapi. And they landed in, uh, in uh, 1978, uh, April, and within less than a year, a huge bustling town was created with a fishing unit, with bakeries, with schools, with, um, with so many other amenities, roads, and all that. It was beautifully created without much outside help, except for people, except for some people from the uh, outside community um, would go there to guide them on, uh, you know, how to create basic communities. The water was very salty around the island. So uh, they had some per person come from the mainland to teach them how to build a tube well. So this self-sufficiency is a very threatening thing for the ruling class, especially the upper caste. So uh, CPM in uh, West Bengal at that time um, were again very threatened by the self-sufficiency because this was a community that they promised they would bring to West Bengal. And they not only did not do that, but also because of that, because of that lack of response from their side and going back on their promise, they also see wow. that these people are capable of again being self-sufficient. The same thing that why they became refugees in the first place to weaken the Namashudra community. So um, this became uh, this became very threatened, uh, uh, very much a threat for them. Um, and the, one of the first things that they did uh, was um, cold-bloodedly poisoning the only tube well that they had made. So because the water was salty, there was a tube well built, and poisoning that tube well led to thirteen people's death. And then slowly this started happening. And then in 2000, uh, again, I'm going to 2000s. In, in 1979, um, January beginning, um, the CM of, uh, CM of West Bengal then, Jyoti Basu, Jyoti Basu uh, went to Murarji Deshai, who was the uh, prime minister at the time, writing, saying that these people have created, uh, I remember this term from the uh, letter, which was a, um, some, I, I don't remember the exact term, but it was, uh, it was talking about how they had created a free state there, where they are doing whatever they want. So this basic concept of not needing outside help was the basic threat to them. And in, in the letter, Jodi Basu had asked for um, you know, a, green, a green signal to anything that he does to repatriate the uh, settlers in the island. And Muraji Deshai wrote back to him saying that nobody has asked me yet of what is happening there and if there is something going to happen, but you can take whatever measure, whichever way that you want, and I will be answering to everybody who asked me what happened and why it happened. So you don't worry, you go ahead with it. And it in, into the, uh, in, in 1979, when the whole country was celebrating uh, Republic Day on Jan's 26th, an economic blockade and a complete blockade of the island took, uh, took place. That would also mean the ration that was coming from outside was stopped. Uh, food and so many other things. The tube well was uh, anyway poisoned, so no water and all that. So this caused a huge malnutrition, huge uh, starvation situation where children and old people were dying and their bodies were again thrown to the water because there was nothing else to do. And on Jan 31st, um, 30 bo boats were launched around the island so that nobody gets out. And then Zen. The islanders, yeah. Sorry to We're, interrupt. Uh, let's wrap it, you mean? Um, can you take five minutes yeah. to conclude? Yeah, 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 sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, basically what happened was um, 
they capsize the entire the the people who are trying to get on the water to get to the other islands to get ration and all that and then an entire carnage took place which killed on that day alone 1700 people and then what happened after that over the course of three months including being deported back to these back to the camps and all these places 17000 people are said to have died and um, uh, you know, not accounted for and so many uh, situations like that. So this is basically what happened in Marijapi and uh, how we can see similar patterns of uh, preventing documentations in different marginalized communities also. Uh, the last thing with regard to hijab right now, what is happening again uh, with regard to hijab is not new. Um, this is only the, the legal culmination or the materialistic culmination of what has been happening for a long time of, um, you know, of having to prove myself or my own sisters within the community that the reason why they are donning the hijab is uh, not compulsion, it was not coerced and all, all that. And um, even, even in anti-CA protests where the Muslim community was the ones who were targeted the most, um, within the protest and uh, states trampling down that was happening also. Um, when, when those protests were happening, Muslim women wearing the hijabs with uh, visible markers of identity were trampled down most because again, the, the, the hatred is also very personal. So the uh, people uh, with, uh, with the power does uh, do that. And when we, when in such, progressive circles, uh, in progressive in, inverted comma circles, we, we say that we need more understanding towards this and we need more protest and awareness regarding how uh, people with visible markers are trampled down. They go on to, th there was an experience where, um, uh, again, a prominent leader in Delhi circle said, um, listen, Iranian women are throwing off their off their hijab. Like it's it's time that you also did. So it it never ends. So this has been happening for a long time, and um, this is like from having to save Muslim women through triple talaq bills to suddenly through CA movements them understanding that Muslim women are taking up space in the streets and completely doing the ownership of spaces and their own voices, they understood that this cannot be, these women have to be, you know, uh, th this is such a threat. So uh, that, that, that is how the uh, culmination with regard to Karnataka uh, colleges and all are happening. So all the banning uh, that seem absurd with regard to beef or with regard to um, houses being demolished all these that seem absurd at its inception are only gradually and very strategically introduced to the uh, public so that like uh, so that a feeling of normalcy is there it it starts with one today and it it and the state increases the density and intensity of what they do in the uh, after a few months so that there is a normalcy regarding what happened and then it keeps on happening so that it, the progressive circles can go on saying that this has been the final nail in the coffin of Indian democracy over and over again, while the Muslim community and other uh, marginalized communities stay here uh, victimized with a feeling of numbness. That is all that I'm ending today's with. Uh, I can, uh, we can uh, open the floor for discussion, Swati. Thank you, Swati. Uh, um well thank you Zainab. thank you so much for uh these uh these reflections your experiences uh if you want to take a moment uh, uh to yeah. drink some water yeah, let uh, me do pause that. please uh, yes yeah, okay thank you so much Zainab. um so you've been very generous in your reflections your own journey of uh you know, being a student in an elite university um, and finding your own community through that isolation, finding communities uh, through the shared trauma as you have experienced. And you've 
uh, articulated it very beautifully the milestones of your life your journey of finding this bahujan uh, camaraderie solidarities and my question uh, i'll be starting with the question that i want to ask uh, uh, and a comment as well uh, my question is in the line of solidarities again because uh, it's a running theme of this lecture series but also what we've been uh, discovering uh, through these protests that have been going on uh, marginalized communities speaking truth to power uh, they've been coming together these solidarities are not uh, perfect they are in the making there are fractures and all that uh, nuances are there and we have uh, we are not a homogeneous whole the minorities are not homogeneous who regional diversities linguistic educational all of that name it but yet we've been able to foster create uh, uh, this space for having a dialogue around solidarity so um, i was in fact uh, listening to uh, one of the scholars of media and communication studies murli shanmugavelan uh, his research is focusing on understanding everyday communication practices uh, of people living in the margins and it's so interesting that he also talks about um these markers of communication the way uh, the pakast community uh, the mainstream sort of tolerates is benevolent uh when on the whims and wishes uh but there is also this uh communication in which way they alienate the other so without uh, reducing this down to bi binary but there is uh, like through your experiences you've also given examples of how systematically we are shown our places so to say uh, and when we are taking spaces uh, it is looked at threatening um so uh, it is interesting what he uh, was asked in one of the uh sessions that he was talking about uh, the communicate communication practices and the violence of communication and so on he was asked uh in all this uh visceral realities that we are hostile realities that we are experiencing can uh annihilation of caste be is it possible to annihilate caste is it possible to annihilate these structural oppressive systems um and he responded by saying that dr ambedkar towards the end of his life uh, uh in the last few decades of his life reflected and wrote extensively on the idea of humanism maitri as fraternity and uh, he wrote that you know constitutional and legal measures will be able to be effective will be able to do their work only when the society and the social psyche are changing simultaneously and uh, and this is a paraphrasing from uh, shanmugavelan but uh, so towards the end uh, ambedkar really understood that you know on human to human interaction uh, would be the change that will be percolated and taking this line of argument shanmugavelan said that uh, these things will have to be on three levels in fact two steps for individuals of the privileged locations of the oppressed caste of the dominant caste locations um, these individuals will have to reflect on their own privileges first and foremost and then the next step would be their own circles social circles because the caste society uh, is very much kith and kin uh, endogamous like you said before and in this kith and kinships their social even if they are rejecting even if they are being benevolent Uh, their social networks will always have inherent privileges for them so how do you then engage with conversations these difficult conversations in your social structures with the goal to dismantle these oppressive structures these very uh, subliminal uh, uh, benevolent it's a, it's a very interesting term i would i would like to explore further um uh but that benevolence with the uh hint of othering i am choosing to be nice to this other not acknowledging our humanity so he says that it's a very interesting uh transformation on your individual level then your community 
for the society's psyche to change, for you to become that anti-caste, anti-Islamophobic side by side to us, allies, even that is a contested term, but so uh, to debunk this Brahminical order, we'll need the consensus of the whole society and individual transformation with the result of social transformation. So in contemporary times, um, the BJP, like we see from all the examples, very systematic examples, these are not isolated inst instances. There is a pattern that we see of social engineering that is happening to isolate and disenfranchise Muslim communities. Uh, in such circumstances, how can we bring back the focus on annihilation of these supremacies, these Brahmin supremacies, Hindutva rise? And how do we change the social discourse? Um, do you see any hopeful changes? Uh, for example, the CANRC uh, protest of the Shine Bag that resonated with a lot of South Asian communities, even uh, liberal uh, spaces. Uh, progressive spaces joined hands and uh, feminist movement has been on the forefront. Uh, then there is a solidarity in the making uh, in the Bahujan spaces, uh, in anti-caste communities. How do you see, uh, could you uh, illustrate with some examples, what do you think of the pathways, future pathways in this dismantling process? All right. Um, so in order to have this collective fight, um, th that's why it's important to have this uh, conglomerate um, intersection of different identities, you know, anti-caste, anti-Islamophobic, um, anti any uh, marginalized communities targeted by the state, like all the discriminations, and having and and having that perspective being important, because not because these communities, uh, for example, Muslims or Dalits, not because they share so many similarities. Not, not because like it's it's very different in terms of social uh, locations and all that, but it is important to understand the the common antagonist in the story is that of the Brahmanical Hindutva, right? So we need to understand this as the core, uh, the the uh, point of instigation for all all uh, uh, marginalized communities within the Indian Indian context. So understanding that, it's important that we forge these community alliances. You know, it's not easy because these are communities that has been going through their own histories of discrimination. And, um, you know, they, they would also often feel that their discrimination stands the uh, worst because their personal experiences are genuinely that horrible. So there needs to be an understanding that the other community, for example, Muslims needs to be mindful of the uh, uh, Dalit um, atrocities that has been happening again on a very benevolent level, more than beyond the atrocity, physical culminations of atrocities. And uh, Dalits need to be understanding of Muslim plight throughout. The Muslim plight is the word I'm using throughout and vice versa in, in, in terms of other marginalized communities also. For this to happen, there needs to be an awareness level, uh, very collective, understanding very collective uh, form of dissemination of information with regard to uh, all the discrimination that has happened. So in contemporary times, I'm glad that you took Shaheen Bagh's example. Uh, we have seen in, 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 in uh, CA, anti-CA time was a very good time for um, you know, this collective uh, solidarity is to have formed in, in uh, smaller levels with very great potentials. Um, we have seen the Sikh community coming to Shaheen Bagh to just freely just donate, like give food, you know, and in other places without like any cap for the number of days that they would be there. Uh, we have seen um, um, Dalit solidarities like uh, Chandrasekhar Azad being uh, on the grounds during that time. I remember, um, I, I think it was the, uh, Divya Kandukuri's uh, like, uh, observation that this is what scares the public the most. And that was the image of uh, Azad in Juma Masjid at, uh, in 2019, um, December 20th, I think. Yeah, yeah. So that image was uh, Azad 
in the center with the constitution in his hand and he is surrounded by muslim brethren right and that entire day was very powerful and that day ended with azad being arrested and that arrested was delayed for a long time because the police was already there and the muslim community the muslim brothers around him were saying if the police need to get to you they need to cross us first so these very wholesome uh, moments where solidarities are beautifully forged and azad saying no if this is this is the stand then something might something unfortunate might happen here today and him despite the brothers and sisters around him him stepping down and walking towards the police to get arrested you know so all these moments of solidarity are very important that's why i refer to um, kanchiram's definition of bahujan uh, you know to uh, it's this this forging you know uh, of all the marginalized communities together to form the marginalized again numeric majority the only common thing that is shared by all these communities is that they are being marginalized and uh, tortured and suppressed and oppressed by the upper caste uh, hindu ethno nationalism yeah I thank you very that. much uh, zainab yes it it uh, it does answer and we have two more questions on solidarity but you beautifully answered i'll still ask because uh, um it might uh, lead to more inter interesting dialogue um so there is uh, someone called preeti gandha naik um she congratulates um uh, for insightful talk and um, thanks for sharing uh, your reflections Uh, she was wondering if uh, you can elaborate further on solidarity patterns between anti-islamophobic and anti-caste movements you have given example maybe we can go further with that and the second question um um what is your message to youth and activists uh, how can uh, they muster their courage and find right path towards justice and solidarity uh, you can choose to answer in whichever form uh uh one second um again uh as i said um again this the same thing there needs to be a very um, um you know structural level of uh, awareness pattern that is happening you know it's uh, i've also understood that uh, the solidarity is when it is not happening it is also because people don't recognize the other community struggles to be also Uh, of very uh, dire state and also um, i've i've understood muslim communities feel uh, that sometimes dalit communities don't understand because of individual islamophobic stance and vice versa again all of this goes both ways because it's both very marginalized communities by the same entity so so to this to to uh, stop this pattern to disrupt that cycle of um, you know finding ways to not stay together we need to again uh, find solidarities find similar minds find solidarities and disseminate that info as to why we need to stand together on different levels in whichever social networks that we have and that is very important so yeah yeah basically that thank you so much uh, zainab um i recently read also in preparation for uh, this uh, session dilip mandal's recent article in the print where uh, he is writing about how muslims are becoming the new bottom quote and quote uh, and he's reflecting on um, how this is so strategic of the oppressor to pit the oppressed against each other uh, and in the caste hierarchy there is always this inclination to be above someone even if you are in the lowest rung you you want to be and this competition he's he's unpacking it with isabel wilkerson's caste uh, uh definition where she's saying that when you are in locked in a bottom room of the building and the room is getting flooded there is a sense of urgency that is made to for you to you to get out of that bottom and at the cost of standing at the on the shoulders of those who are with you around you and this is this there is another term that is been uh, explored by other black feminist scholars 
to express this oppression olympics and so on um, and i i i completely agree with you that this discourse of solidarity which so, that which by the way have been existing for such a long should continue because this hindutva muslim binary is being created whereas there is a majority oppressed communities their marginalization by that one like you said i'm just highlighting what you've been saying uh, one ideology so it, this discourse needs to be uh, reiterated and kept alive uh, i agree um, there is one question um, about um, i think we've touched upon it but maybe you won't want to take it further um, could you please uh, talk a bit about manifestation of caste in muslim communities if you don't feel comfortable you can choose uh, not to yeah um caste among muslim communities one uh, one it exists um the difference from um the point of difference from hindu caste system and caste among muslim communities that it's in the uh, nomenclature that are used itself one is hindu caste system and one is caste among muslim communities as, and not islamic caste system um i forgot the scholar who made this um, um, observation but i think he was from bombay university uh, that in order to get out of caste uh, system in hinduism one needs to annihilate the whole structure and come out of the structure while in order to uh, get out of caste caste like communities uh, caste like uh, structures within muslim several uh, muslim communities which is not true for all muslim communities in all geographical locations one needs to come go back to islam islam uh, necessarily preaching uh, its message of brotherhood and uh, equality for all mankind uh, does not have caste system within its uh, doctrine or anything so this observation was that when uh, lower caste communities uh, converted to uh, islam uh, in the early times of uh, you know uh, the, the early times of uh, early history of subcontinent um, they are still labeled by the local uh, locality that they are in that they were dalits or whatever before right so this is still there so when they are when they are converting them being muslims were not you know like it, it threatens them again right like you can't suddenly come out of caste system and be muslim and say that you are equal to us no you are not so this cultural imposition that happened over time again caused very stringent caste like formations within different parts of bihar west bengal um, uh, pakistan if you are talking about it kashmir and so many places like that but that's again very geographical and culturally happening while uh, in hindu system uh, it is intrinsic to hinduism to have caste system which is the structure that uh, holds the whole uh, hindu system together i think that answers it yeah thank you zainab uh, we've answered the questions from the q and a uh, if uh, you have more questions um, from the audience i'm asking if you have more questions please feel free to put but uh, in the meantime i will also ask question that rupali uh, posed for you um, yeah. so um, she 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 writes um, uh, that uh, you've reflected about rohit's institutional murder and talked about your own journey uh, dealing with anxiety and uh, identity anxiety uh, there is a clear impact of caste violence uh, and uh, on one hand marginalized face you know this uh, oppression lack of uh, courage but on the other hand they are stronger they are uniting they are speaking truth to power like we said before um, how do we see uh, uh if you are like since you you didn't mention this but we i think we can we have some minutes to talk about it you are uh, wanting to pursue your uh, degree in psychology counseling for uh, a particular reason coming from a certain standpoint um you are intending to becoming a therapist uh, so why does why is such work important um uh especially in the fast paced social media led and very heinous world that we are living in 
uh, and the inequalities that we are facing, uh, what would be your message to people, women and marginalized uh, and other genders uh, who are trying to make space for themselves in this uh, very hierarchical society, caste society? Uh, so these are the questions from Rupali, uh, responding to why you chose to be a, are choosing to be a therapist or psychologist, and what would be your message? That's not an, that's not an information that has been yet public, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's of course bound to be public, uh, anyways. Like when when you're uh, choosing a different career uh, path altogether, um, reflecting on Rohit's murder and uh, Fatima Latif's murder and all these happening very institutionally. These are clear evidences that not all people within marginalized communities come out of their, like, you know, these marginalized students are in these very privileged campuses with a lot of dreams and they do not even come out of the other side alive. That's, that's one fact that we live with. And um, that's why I also said, uh, despite having Bahujan circles around you, Rohit was also in, in a situation where there were social circles, strong social circles formed organizationally, politically also. Despite that, uh, um, this, this uh, eventuality had to take place. Because at the end of the, uh, end of, end of the day, it's a very individual experience. You know, even though the trauma is collective, even though the, the uh, genesis of the trauma is collective, the experience is very individualistic. So um, uh, I've had many friends of mine who go to these uh, therapeutic um, sessions that they uh, keep off for a long time and then, then they finally go and talk about the traumas that they carry uh, institutionally also. And they have people who dismiss this whole thing happening. So uh, we have seen um, therapists claiming to be uh, using a feminist lens to, um, you know, have an inter therapeutic intervention. So that's one great thing that we have. But we also need to have, um, you know, culturally sensitive, um, hierarchy informed, uh, Islamophobia trauma informed, casteist tra trauma informed therapeutic interventions. So like even American uh, Psychiatric Association also acknowledges this uh, uh, eventuality that uh, just speaking about the Muslim cause happens that how Muslims going through this uh, constant uh, the process of having uh, uh, this constant process of discrimination needs to have their own uh, culturally sensitive uh, uh, therapeutic interventions and how that is a need. So yeah, that's that's basically that. Thank you so much, Zainab. Uh, we it's a uh, time for us to conclude, and we've covered uh, the questions from the audience. I just see there is one more. Uh, we can you can have a concluding remark, or you can respond to this question, whichever is comfortable for you. Um, this is Anisha. The previous questions were anonymous. That's why I did not uh, take the names of the uh, uh, person who was asking questions. But this is Anisha. Um, and she's asking, or it's a comment. Recently, she attended a play in London trying to vilify Muslim cultural ethos and pitting it against veganism. Uh, would you be able to shed light on how the world is mirroring the right wing antics in our country and? what one can do to create more pushback for such art being created? It's a very interesting question and good to... Yeah. 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 Um, so one thing that's to be said is that, again, none of this is new to be happening. Um, the people, you know, it's, it's not the world mirroring what is happening in India. It's also... Um, the, most of the people who have uh, emigrated to US and UK and all these places are people with caste cultural capital being handed down and accumulated and handed down for since, uh, like so many centuries, right? And those are the people who first leave the country to all these uh, better situations to frame it that way. So uh, it's not uh, new that that this is happening for me when I read that question, very interesting question, but it did not surprise me at all. Uh, recently, Swati, we have known how like 
caste came to be a discriminatory category in various universities yeah. across uh, um, uh, us right and and the, the funny part is like caste became a protected category in various universities across us and when we are looking at it from here we would think why would caste be a protected category if we don't know the cultural things happening there it's 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 at par with racism in terms of the protected category the thing is when when we see that we need we also would be like okay good job uh, the good the good job to have done that but you also see people indians in us protesting that uh, inclusion of caste as a protected category so this has always been there you know and uh, the overall sentiment uh, in us or it's all at par with what's happening in the country it's not the sudden mirroring of that's happening it's again the culmination of benevolent forms of uh, racism that they have been cul uh, cultivating inside them for years so yeah yeah and uh, to add to that we also have uh, art as a form of resistance so there is also art that you can turn to uh, yeah. from antika spaces from muslim spaces how muslim uh, community young people women are taking to social media and using it as a tool uh, to to assert uh, and resist so those are also examples alongside these uh, oppressive traits where art is uh bent it twisted to uh uh forward the rhetoric of you know the supremacist racist rhetoric uh, uh thank you so much zainab and thank you very much for uh, um the audience who is here uh, till the last minute we have uh, come to the end of our session we have other last uh, session of our lecture series uh, coming on 5th of may um which is talking about in fact caste in diaspora uh, with the um, um example of united states and this um um uh, fight of young uh, students university students to um recognize caste in the university spaces in the institutional spaces so please join that session to register for that and also uh, amplify thank you very much and have a good evening everybody uh, thank you. Pati, for having me here. Jai Bhim to you. Jai Bhim, Jai Bhim, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye.